Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at the rise of the Third Reich and I suppose the events that led to the beginning of World War II. And so far this week, Katia has taken us through the political situation, the economic situation in Germany that allows the Nazi party to establish their, their rule and what have you. And then we looked at the, the, the relationship with alcohol with Edward and then we looked yesterday at the Third Reich, the, the Napola, the schools with Helen Roche. So today, we're going to talk about the expansion because the Third Reich means way more than just Germany. It means the plans to expand that empire that we know happened and we know that the tragic consequences of that. But central to everybody's ambitions in the late 1930s, and we will be talking about the Soviet Union today as well, is Poland. And Poland had quite a complicated history post-First World War leading up to 1939, and then a very complicated 1939, a very horrible and tragic war, and then a kind of complicated 1945 and a complicated future till today. But to bring us in and talk about this subject, Roger Morehouse is a, you know, obviously a, something of a historical legend, lots of books, lots of presentations, lots of public speaking. And he has written about the German aspect and he has written about the Polish aspect. And therefore, those two are exactly what we need today to kind of unravel this, this, this Poland's role in World War II. So without further ado, I introduce Roger Morehouse. So good evening, Roger. How are you today? Hello, Paul. I'm very well. You, are you well? I'm good. So as we said, Poland is central to everything. It's essential to everybody's ambitions. It's essential to the expansion. It's it's it, it's 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 where World War II start. Although a lot of our viewers watching, they think about from where they're from. If you're a USA, it's Pearl Harbor. If you're Chinese, it's but, but Poland in terms of Europe. So welcome to the show first. But run us through the in a very brief term as the kind of post First World War up to the sort of late 1930s, what Poland was doing and how its borders were changing and how its governments were going. Uh, just to kind of set the scene for us, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Poland, of course, um, unlike Czechoslovakia, which is another, another one of those states that sort of appears in the, in the aftermath of the, of the First World War, um, Poland had uh, a very rich tradition as a state, you know, going way back to the Middle Ages and beyond. Um, at one point in the, in the 17th century, it was the largest state in Europe, for example. Uh, stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea, um, and it was had a rich military tradition and all of that stuff. It was the it was the countries whose army had uh, you know beaten the Turks back from the gates of Vienna in uh, 1683, um, but it had fallen foul of its neighbours um, after that. So in the late um, 18th century and throughout the 19th century, it was partitioned. It was gradually swallowed up by its neighbours, um, primarily Russia and Prussia. Um, and also Austria-Hungary, or, or what, what was, you know, Habsburg monarchy before it was Austria-Hungary, um, also was a partitioning power. So as of 1795, Poland didn't exist. It wasn't on the map. Um, you've got all those po Polish populations across, you know, that area that we would now nowadays call Poland. But um, um, Poland itself as a state didn't exist. Um, and that was the state basically that, that runs up until, that was the situation that runs up until the First World War. Um, and all of those partitioning powers conscript um, Polish um, young men to fight in their armies in 1914. Um, so by the time that those same three partitioning powers have all collapsed in 1918, so the Russian Empire's collapsed, we know, 1917 collapses in revolution. Germany collapses in revolution uh, in 1918, as does the Habsburg monarchy. So the three powers that have effectively kept Poland down all collapse in, uh, uh, at the end of the First World War. So Poland is, you know, allowed to to reemerge, um, and it's a bit of a myth that we we sort of imagine that the post-war settlement, the Versailles settlement, and all of that, you know, the the gentlemen in in wing collars and top hats sitting in in Versailles in 1919, that they sort of sit down and redraw the maps of Europe. They don't in this case. Poland is sort of reborn, um, de facto on the ground. It's reborn because Polish politicians and Polish soldiers, many of you know military men, many of whom had fought in the armies of one of one or other of those um, partitioning powers, um, essentially take it upon themselves in that power vacuum to restore a Poland, a Polish state. So when Poland is restored, you know, in November 1918, um, it doesn't really have an army, it doesn't have a constitution, it doesn't know what sort of state it's going to be, but it knows it's there, right? So it starts to yeah. sort of expand itself into that power vacuum in which it, it, it it's existing. Um, and that means a sort of a succession of, of 
small wars, uprisings, uh, insurrections, whatever you want to call them, against its neighbours, primarily, you know, initially, primarily the Germans. Um, Russia, Soviet Union, what becomes the Soviet Union, has kind of descended into a little bit of chaos at that point with the, the, the uh, revolution and the beginning phase of the civil war. Um, so the initial phases of these conflicts is against the Germans. So you've got various uprisings, sort of Upper Silesia, and then Vielkopolska, which is the sort of main area around around um, um, Poznan or Posen, um, which is now Western Poland. Um, so they're sort of fighting rather desultory wars and uprisings against against German, usually the Freikorps, you know, these sort of Freikorps that you've heard about. Um, mm. I know Katja talked about them um, a couple of days ago. Um, essentially, German soldiers, German military units that come back from the war had nothing to do, were supposed to have been disbanded, but the only home they've got is the military, so they kind of stay in the military. Um, and a lot of them ended up fighting against the Poles on those east, on those sort of ragged eastern frontiers from the German perspective. Um, and in many cases, losing. Um, the, the Poles were quite quite well organised. They had a very um, a very strong sort of national ethos. That idea of of, of restoring Poland after 123 20, 23 years of partition was one that was a, a great motivator for them, and they were largely successful. And they also benefited from the largesse of the Western powers. So the French gave them a lot of tanks, gave them a lot of aircraft and so on, which the Germans didn't really have. So, you know, they, they were quite successful in those um, sort of border battles, mm. effectively drawing their new frontier. Um, and in the process, actually incorporating quite a lot of ethnic Germans and, and territory that had been German for, for, um, for you know, certainly centuries. Um, into the new Poland. And, that, and then the same process happens on the eastern frontier against the Soviets. So you then have this, um, the Polish-Soviet war, you have a Polish-Ukrainian war briefly in 1919, then you have a Polish-Soviet war, 1919, 1920. The Soviets, that ebbs and flows across that, you know, wide open spaces of Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, the, the Soviets briefly, the Red Army looks like it's gonna take Warsaw in August of 1920. And are beaten back by a sort of flanking attack by Polish cavalry. Um, Red Army is scattered, and that and at that point, you know, the um, from a Kremlin perspective, the game is up. They, their their intention was to spread communism westwards across Poland and ideally into Germany. That's where they wanted to get to. They wanted to get to the to the proletariat of German industry, who they thought were kind of you know waiting, gasping, waiting for communism to come and liberate them. But they needed to get across Poland, and unfortunately, the Poles didn't play ball, and the Poles um, defeated them outside Warsaw. So, that was a sort of running sore on the on the Soviet side. That's a that's a good reason for particularly Stalin, uh, but others as well to have a harbour a real contempt for the Poles. Um, so they essentially, to a large extent, draw their own frontiers, um, which is then, then retrospectively kind of rubber stamped by Versailles. So. This kind of idea that you know the German complaint is always about Versailles. That's always the shorthand, like you heard from Katja as well. Mm. That's always the shorthand through um, German politics in the 1920s and 30s. Is that you know Versailles is to blame? Versailles is the root of all of our all of our all of our uh, woes. In this case, actually, the Poles had, had kind of drawn their own frontiers and they they battled themselves back into existence even before the to a large extent even before the men that sat at Versailles sat down. Um, so it's a, that's the, just a, you know it's a minor point to make, but I think quite a significant one as well. So Poland sort of writes its own frontiers effectively by you know at bayonet point, but it does. Um, the result of that is that the Poland that's reborn. I don't know if you if you can throw one of those maps up, um, Paul. The Poland that's reborn, and you can sort of see the frontier of Poland on that map. So that's that's sort of post 1918. You can see the um, um, Germany with its Germany in the pink has got its um, the province of East Prussia, which is cut off from the rest of Germany by the, the so-called Polish corridor. There we are, it's a bit bigger there. So East Prussia is there, cut off by the Polish corridor. Um, provinces that sort of, that those two, almost like the jaws of a pincer, you've got Pomerania in the north and Silesia in the south. Um, and Poland is a much more peculiar shape than, um, you know, the Pol Poland we know now, which is broadly square and about, you know, 200 kilometers to the west of where it was then. So it has this massive sort of hinterland to the to the right hand side to the east, um, going right out as it, as you can see to Vilna, Vilnius, now the capital of Lithuania, uh, Pinsk, which is now in in Belarus, and right down to Lvov, uh, which is now of course Lviv in Ukraine. So 
it's much further east than it is now and it's a very very different shape and as you can see from that um, because of the sort of disposition of um, the German provinces as I just mentioned not least East Prussia and, and Silesia it's almost like Poland is already in the jaws of a German pincer before a shot's been fired but that's jumping back that's jumping forward to 19, yeah. 1939 of course but you can see that you know geostrategically Poland is not in a great position vis-a-vis -vis Germany Germany sort of already surrounds it on three sides effectively which is not ideal but anyway so Poland uh, is it reforms itself and but as I said, in the process of reforming itself um, and defeating its its neighbours, who are you know both the Soviet Union and Germany are really on the uppers anyway in that in that period anyway, um, Poland sort of pushes its frontiers effectively as far as it possibly can, which means incorporating large numbers of minorities. So you're left with this sort of paradox in interwar Poland, which is quite significant. This is an important issue, and it it's important all the way through in terms of in terms of how, the, as the Poles call it, the Second Republic, that interwar republic, um, in terms of how the politics of the Second Republic was so fractious, but also it's important in 1939 because of you know the, the army didn't have a sort of an inter internal coherence and internal um, you know narrative of itself, if you like, because it has all of these national minorities who are more or less unhappy with it. So you've got large minorities of Ukrainians, Belarusians. Uh, about a million or just under a million Germans mainly in that area of uh, the Polish corridor and that sort of lump that as you can see sort of sticks into into <clears throat> Germany uh, in the direction of Berlin so there's like you know about 800,000 ethnic Germans there's something like four million Ukrainians um, something like three million Belarusians so it's it, large numbers and that that proves difficult it proves difficult because the interwar Poland because it's you know reborn after all that the time disappeared from the map, um, drawing on the rich history from the, from the late Middle Ages and all of that stuff. Interwar Poland is quite nationalistic, it's quite patriotic, and it doesn't sort of sit well. So there's a fundamental paradox there uh, in Polish politics, which never really resolves itself. Uh, and as I said, proves to be quite um, uh, significant in 1939. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you for that. And of course, while Poland is, and I think you, your phrase there, kind of finding its identity, finding its 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 place in Europe, all through the twenties and thirties. Meanwhile, to its across the border, Germany, and of course Hitler is now thinking about his aspirations. So uh, we know what Hitler has planned for Germany. We've talked about that with Katia, with Edward, with 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 Helen yesterday, but. Obviously, he's all from very early on. He's got his eyes on what's east of him, and mm. and they're watching these changing situations in Poland. And yeah, so so, when does Poland become priority number one for Hitler? There's a very kind of crass way of wording the question there, but, yeah. but when does really Poland become central to Hitler's ambitions? Um, I think you have to understand there's there's sort of long term and short term ambitions, um, both territorially and politically for, for the Third Reich. Um, so the short term, the more immediate ambition is to unite all Germans effectively in under one yeah. uh, political entity. Right. This is the sort of greater Germany project. So, you know, the, the idea of Anschluss with Austria, for example, is 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 higher up the agenda for the, for the you know, the, the Hitler and others in Berlin. Um, than anything to do with Poland, and the same thing with re, with um, um, uh, remilitarizing the Rhineland, which you know that that happens in um, in thirty six, of course. Um, the Saarland is another one that happens in thirty five. So you know that that element of of essentially restoring again to to use the sort of the the the, the propaganda sort of slogans of the Nazis, but they're quite fitting, really. The idea of restoring German honor. That's mm. what, a line that the Germans, the Nazis always used to use in this period. And it meant basically sort of uniting all German people within the same state, primarily, removing um, foreign occupation or foreign restrictions on what, you know, on a sovereign Germany, like in the Rhineland. But the Rhineland, you know, by decree of the Western powers was supposed to be demilitarized. Um, and you understand why, of course, but... You know, from a German perspective, that's kind of like a like a stab in the heart. So why can't we why can't we do what we want in our own territory, right? So that, these things had priority in terms of you know geopolitical, geostrategic objectives over anything to do with Poland. Um, 
and Poland actually, you know, relations with with Germany were, you could probably say, correct um, for most of this period. Um, there was an undercurrent on the German side. There's certainly an undercurrent of um, hostility. You could say sort of low level contempt. You could say polonophobia, if you like, and that's something that had gone right through from the 19th century. There's a by the time Hitler comes to power in 33, there's an overlaying on top of that of of racial um, you know, anti-Polonism, really quite radical and, and quite quite bloodthirsty and biological in its nature. But anti-Polish anti-Polish thinking is you know in Germany goes right back into the Wilhelmine Reich and into the 19th century. And to to sort of understand it in a way, I always use the analogy of trying to think about um, British attitudes or English attitudes, should we say, towards the Irish. Yeah. In this period. Right. Uh, in the 19th century, early 20th century. So, you know, the, the politicians in London, for example, would look at Ireland and say, well, Ireland, they're, they're sort of our country cousins. They're they're a bit more primitive than we are. Um, they're Catholic. So that's a kind of a dodgy thing. Right. So we don't really trust them. Um, um, they're a bit hot headed. Um, so it's all of the same tropes, actually, that the Germans yeah. view the Poles with. Right. They're Catholics. They're a bit hot headed. Um, you can't trust them. You know, one one pole is a charmer, but, you know, three of them is a threat sort of thing. You know, um, you know, wouldn't trust them with your with your daughter or the babysitting. It's that it's the same kind of mentality. Right. So this sort of anti-Polish thinking goes right back in, you know, as a, almost a 19th century trait through through um, German public life. Um, and then you overlay that, as I said, by the time Hitler comes to power and you've got this really aggravated, or certainly, you know, in the 1930s, late 20s, when Nazism is a is a coming creed um, in Germany. You overlay that traditional um, anti-Polonist, anti-Polish sentiment with um, a much more sort of quite rabid, quite um, biological anti-Polish sentiment, and of course anti-Semitism as well, because yeah. Poland is has a large Jewish population of about three million, largely unassimilated Jews. Um, bear in mind, by, by comparison, Germany has a Jewish population when Hitler comes to power in 33, has a, a Jewish population of about 160,000. It's, it's, it's really rather small. Um, and he does, from by his own perspective, he does relatively well in um, you know, persuading, in inverted commas, persuading those Jews by, by um, low level persecution to emigrate. So by the time war breaks out, that population is halved. Um, in Germany. Um, and bear in mind as well that German Jews are largely um, assimilated. You know, they, yeah. they don't have you know, ringlets, kaftans, all of those sort of stereotypical images that the Nazis used all the time in their propaganda. Um, and what they're basically describing is, is what they called Eastern Jews, which are the Jews that tended to live in Poland. They didn't live in Germany, generally. Um, so again, there's that element as well. Anti-Semitism feeds into this sort of anti-Polish sentiment. And then, of course, Poland is, as a state and as the country that had been party to that humiliation of Germany in 1918 that I just described, all those border wars, it had regained territory at Germany's extent, expense in 1918. So it's part of that whole Versailles humiliation. That's how it's seen from a German perspective. So there's sort of layers of this anti-Polish anti sentiment. Um, this is expressed actually quite, quite um powerfully in an incident in um, 1930, um, which is called the Potempa incident, which I, I don't know if anyone else has sort of talked about this when we talked about the Third Reich, but it's quite interesting oh, yeah. illustration of, of German-Polish attitudes or German attitudes towards the Poles. And this happened in Silesia, which is that sort of um, that tongue of land that, uh, you know, the, the, the bottom jaw of the German, the jaw, German uh, uh, sort of pincer. Um, and in Silesia had you know, on the German side of the frontier had had Polish um, uh, minorities as well. And in one sort of small town, this town of Potempa, um, a local Polish communist, this was in 1930, it's before Hitler comes to power, a local Pol, Pol who's also a communist, um, fell foul of a local SA unit and they decided to go and beat him up. Uh, and six of them ended up kicking this boy to death. His name was Konrad Pietzuch. Uh, and he was kicked to death in front of his mother. And... Um, as I said, this is this is before Hitler comes to power, and it became a cause celebre because they were they were SA, SA men, as I said, they were they were stormtroopers, um, and it became a cause celebre in, in German politics because, as you'd expect, the German state prosecuted these men for murder, 
Uh, and during the trial and the run up to the trial, the Nazis sort of made a big the Nazi movement, made a big thing about Potempa, basically saying, you know, you can't prosecute a German for murdering a Pole. Right. It's it's sort of racially unacceptable. So they made a big thing of this and it shows you very, very strongly the Nazi attitude. Um, and they tr they made actually quite, in a sense, political capital out of this, because to a lot of people it was. Well, you can't possibly, you know, it, all right, it's not, it's not, it's not nice what happened, of course, but, you know, you can't sort of prosecute these boys for just getting into a fight with a pole. You know, they kind of, they thought the poles were were beneath them fundamentally. And it's interesting that when Hitler comes to power in 1933, one of the first things he does is to pardon the Potempa killers, right? And they're released from prison. So that kind of shows you that under, underlying anti-Polish sentiment and then the overlaying of, of really quite radical um nazi nazi anti-polish sentiment on top of that but aside from all of that just to sort of bring that all to a into a um sort of a close as i said before in terms of interstate relations between the two they're actually they're reasonably correct um you know for example the you know the the great um uh statesman of interwar poland who was who was Józef Piłsudski, and he had been very he'd been instrumental in creating Poland in 1918. He was the man that effectively, you know, had uh, to use that phrase that Lenin used, he'd, he'd, he'd found he'd found power lying in the street in Warsaw in 1918, and he'd picked it up. Uh, and that kind of is quite fitting um, into the situation in 1918. And he was very much the man who, who made the interwar republic. And it's a, it's a, it's a democracy, a, a not entirely functioning democracy, but up until 1926, and then there's a coup d'etat, and Pilsudski comes to power, and he comes to power essentially as a sort of, dare I say, a benign dictator. Um, it's not a dictatorship. They, you know, the the the, the, um, the the democratic structure and the processes are still there. You might call it a managed managed democracy at this point. And um, Pilsudski is the man that you know is synonymous with interwar Poland, and he dies in 1935. So he's in power for for nine years. Um, but interestingly, uh, when his um, collected papers or speeches, I think it was, were published in a German edition, which I think was in 1935, around the time of his death, um, it was published with a preface by one Hermann Goering. Um, so there was, a, there was a certain degree of admiration, certainly, for someone like Pilsudski, because he was a big figure in European history um, on the part of the Germans. So they certainly admired him and what he'd achieved. So aside from all of that, um, we could say, um, you know, German contempt for Poland, there are still correct relations. And, you know, that that episode is quite telling. Um, they, they sign a non-aggression pact between them, for example, you know, that's in 1934. Um, non-aggression pacts were all the rage, of course, in the 1930s. So that doesn't <laughs> tell you much. But, you know, there was a non-aggression pact between the two. Um, but, you know, relations are more or less correct. Now, where this to jump forward to to you know the, the the sort of the nub of this which is 1938 39 poland sort of comes onto the radar really um essentially after munich so munich in the in the autumn of 1938 you know the the, the forced dismemberment of czechoslovakia uh, again we have to bear in mind that the munich settlement looks kind of rational it looks sen sensible um, from the perspective that, from the perspective of the time, because it fitted into that sort of that that pattern of um, the Germans exercising that desire to unify all Germans in the in a German state. And the idea of dismantling Czechoslovakia at the time was to allow those the Sudeten Germans in that fringe that you can see around that mm. that the outside of Czechoslovakia there. To allow them to be annexed by Germany, so that was essentially what what the Munich Treaty was. So it still fitted within that sort of rubric of, oh, you know, this is still Germany just expanding, you know, to its ethnic limits. Effectively, they're not taking foreign territory yet. This is how the, the Western powers justified it to themselves what they were doing. Um, so that's the sort of high watermark of appeasement because the idea is if you if you if you meet those in inverted commas, legitimate German demands, um, then hopefully the German beast will be sated and it won't be so aggressive and all of that stuff. That's the that's very broadly is the logic of appeasement, yeah. which from the perspective of 38 is quite logical. The problem is, if you fast forward to the spring of 39, of course, uh, 
Hitler then marches into the rest of Czechoslovakia, uh, occupies Bohemia and Moravia, occupies Prague. Uh, and actually, from a historical perspective, that's the first foreign, i.e. foreign inhabited territory, non-German inhabited territory that he's occupied. So everything up until that point has been German speaking populations. Yeah. So in a sense, it was kind of excusable. And then in the spring, March of 1939, that happens, the occupation of Bohemia and Moravia, and the Western powers throw their hands up and say, well, you know, appeasement's failed. We have to be much more robust in our dealings with Germany. And that's where appe appeasement is thrown out the window. And the next thing on the agenda appears to be Poland, because you have this, um, the Polish corridor, large German populations in there. You've got um, uh, the province province of uh, Posen, or as the Germans put it, Posen, or Poznan, um, large German populations there as well. So just you know, about 800,000 Germans in, in Poland at that point. Um, so that looks like it's going to be the next target. So then you have this, um, the Allied British guarantee to Poland and incidentally to Romania as well, which was also foreseen as a possible target. Um, so that, that in a sense brings us up to 1939, where, um, as I said, all those tensions are there beneath the surface. But up until that point, relations between Germany and Poland were more or less correct. Uh, but it's at this point that the Germans actually start sort of saber rattling against Poland in a much more sort of serious and concerted mm. way. And just to kind of summarize what we're talking about in that expansion, are we, and I'm, by we, I mean those of us who read from an English language, Western, British, American, Canadian point of view, are we now a bit guilty 80 years on of kind of um, whipping through that sort of 35 to 39 period too quickly. We look at those animated maps where the German Empire kind of just expands out left and right, and we don't treat these individual expansions, as you say, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, as the separate things they are that each have their own integral um, um, logic, yeah. histories and logic to them. We just yeah. kind of group them into that period there because it's our Western way of looking at it. And Alina, for example, who's watching tonight would say, no, we need to slow down and, and go through this stages, looking at it more progressively as it, as those who are living in those areas would have been doing at the time. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, one of the sort of crimes of history is, is reading it backwards. You know, that yeah. everything in that period is, is is nothing but a lead up to what happened in 1939. And, you know, in one way you can understand why that's just quite a seductive um, uh, scheme, because that's what we're taught at school and all the rest yeah. of that. You know, that you, you learn history in its chronological order. But you're right. I mean, each one of these events has a logic to it. And, and you have to, the other thing, you know, aside from you know, the, the crime of teleology, that which is the, the technical word for reading history backwards or looking at history backwards. You have to kind of understand each event and each period on its own terms. Um, you know, put yourself in their shoes. That's one of the one of the sort of key key elements of being a historian is to understand why those people did what they did. And and all of this kind of makes logical sense, as I as I just explained, and can be rationalized. Um from a Western perspective and also from a German one, until you get to that occupation of Bohemian Moravia. And that's where, you know, so, the, you know, the bad rep that appeasement gets, actually, you know, appeasement is, a, is quite a rational policy. It's only in retrospect that it doesn't look rational, but it's a rational policy to try and, try and rationally deal peacefully with a threat. Um, and as I said, up until that point, um, all Hitler had done was want to occupy and annex territory inhabited by German speakers, right? That's not to excuse it, but that's that's what he was doing up until the spring of 1939. And at that point, that's where the rest of the world or Britain and France throw their hands up and say, okay, appeasement's done, right? You've you've broken every every promise you've you gave us, you've broken the Munich Agreement. Now there's gonna have gonna be a different policy, which is one of containment. The problem the British and the French have is that they haven't got much, i.e. you know, military they've got enough military capacity and they haven't got enough political will to actually follow through on containment of germany that's the problem mm. in, in september 39 so they're they're talking a good game of helping the poles but actually there's not much they can physically do and even that they are politically unwilling to do so this is why yeah. there's this narrative of political inaction by the by the western allies in september 39 which is absolutely correct and it's and it's you know frankly embarrassing but again, that needs to be understood on its own terms as well. And in a sense, 
these countries, and we could include Romania as well and, and Hungary, where the Third Reich and Hitler are thinking in global terms, they're thinking nationally. And, and we, Brit we Brits are guilty as well of thinking about it through how is this going to affect us and our our place in Europe and France are thinking the same kind of thing. I mean, I said it's, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing with this, and I there's a lot more to it. But, but definitely, the, the Germans are thinking on a much bigger scale. They're thinking about all these countries together and how they can then take them in their different manners, one by one by one. And as you say, do it in such a way that the first ones are legitimate. They're just reclaiming their German-speaking territories that they have a historical and political legitimate claim to but yeah. we're, we're all leading up to that to 1939 is probably for poland the most can i just um, can I, can I just wind so, back a bit paul just yeah, on, that, sure. on that on that one comment i think it's it's a bit more complicated than he just described i know you know we're, okay, we're, sure. we're doing shorthand and stuff but it's a little bit more complicated because you know countries you know like hungary for example which you know signed up um as a as an ally of the germans quite quickly um that is certainly thinking in national terms, in its own national terms, because it sees, you know, its great complaint is that it was, you know, hugely sort of truncated and emasculated in the aftermath of, of the um, uh, Treaty of Trianon in 1920, again, going back to, to you know, broadly to Versailles, the Versailles settlement. Um, so it has these sort of territorial demands and irredenta that, that are, are, are never going to be satisfied. So it, it, it's sort of hitching its wagon to Hitler because he sees it sees Hitler as a disruptor and someone that might actually if they follow in his in his coattails and support him, they might get some of that territory back, and they do ter ter temporarily. Um, in the two the two um, uh, Vienna settlements, so they do get some of that territory back, and that explains why why the Hungarians go along with the with the Nazi project. I think in the the other sense is because you said that the British and French are kind of viewing it in national terms. I think there are I think that's wrong. I think there are two sort of fundamental images. There's a there's an image of the of the of the Versailles status quo. Right. that the western powers are keen to stick with they see this as legitimate as something that's settled um everyone's if not happy that at least in a state of sort of well modulated discontent one could say um so that this is the settlement that we've come to we came to in 1919 1920 at the, at the treaty of versailles and the and the subsequent treaties and this is what works and we're going to stick with that this is the status quo and it's a good one or it's the best one that's possible and then you've got the re essentially revisionist powers so that, again that's more than just a national sentiment that's actually trying to stick to some sort of geopolitical system right and then you've got the revisionist powers we could say like hungary but also like germany and like, and the soviet union don't forget the soviet union course, is, yeah. is a revisionist power uh, and the soviet union gets written out of the history of 39 it tried to write itself out of it because it was embarrassing um but it, it needs to be written back in which we'll come to later on the Soviet Union is a very revisionist power. It wants to change Versailles. It wants to change that settlement. So all of these revisionist powers are wanting to tear up that settlement and change everything and put everything back in flux. So that's essentially that's the fight that's going on. So it's not necessarily that one side is thinking in in broader geopolitical mm. terms. One is just thinking about itself and its and its sort of national goals. It's much more two competing visions of how Europe should look. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, but I, I, I'm thinking about the fact that when I'm saying that we are guilty of sort of whizzing through this period, that that definitely stands. But as as you mentioned, Munich back uh, a few minutes ago, we've got a question from Wayne uh, Lutton there, so uh, asking you to comment. In the wake of the Munich Pact, could Professor Morehouse comment on Poland helping themselves to a bit of the disintegrating Czechoslovak state? Yes, um, the Poles uh, do uh, annex a small territory. Um, and it is small. It's part of it's what it's known in German as Teschen, um, um, which is taken by them. But they send the army in when when the um, uh, uh, when Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia is effectively dismembered uh, and in the September in the, in the autumn of 1938, when the September when the um, uh, Munich Treaty is signed. Um, this is often, I think, sort of misconstrued. It's, it it was a mistake. It's a political mistake to do it um, because it, if nothing else, it makes you look like you are um, colluding with Hitler in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia. Right. Um, so I would say yes, it's certainly a political mistake. And, th and that was it was something that um, didn't win the Poles too many friends um, in the international community. Stalin noticed uh, 
and saw it as colluding with Hitler, which it kind of wasn't. I mean, you know, start, uh, Hitler, Hitler's aggression and Western um, appeasement had colluded to force the, the collapse of, of, of Czechoslovakia. And in that process, the, the Poles had said, oh, that bit, we want that bit, so we'll have that. Essentially, that's what they did. So they sent the army. And it's a very small territory. Um, and they occupied it and annexed it to Poland. So the optics, as we'd say nowadays, the optics on this are really bad. Right? It looks like you're mm. colluding with Hitler to, to uh, you know, occupy a chunk of, uh, a chunk of Czechoslovakia. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's something that still gets sort of raised and it gets thrown around, particularly on... Uh, on social media by um sort of tankies and pro-russians and and russian russian uh um uh bots to essentially kind of um make a, a false comparison with the nazi collaboration with uh, the soviet union um over the nazi soviet pact and the two are absolutely not comparable um, so it's bad optics and it was a political mistake, um, but it really isn't, you know, the, the sort of the get out of jail free that the Kremlin thinks it is. Mm. Or thinks it was. OK, good answer. So we're, we're rapidly getting towards the 1939 and, and Germany's expansion and the invasion, what have you. And when we talk about the German invasion of Poland, we can we don't necessarily need to go over the, the, the events that actually kicked it off, although if it comes up, fine. But we when we tell that story and we I mean, all of us, we tell it from the German point of view. Now, that is the way yeah. it is told. But of course, Poland is 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 aware of where it sits. It, it, it is aware of what's happening east. It's aware of what's happening west. So. So sort of from the beginning of 1939, Poland is clearly looking over its shoulders metaphorically and, and, and literally. So how are they preparing themselves for and what they, for the situation that's going to come? And what do they think the situation, uh, what situation do they think is going to happen? And how does it differ from what actually did happen? Well, the Poles have, um, I mean, I, I, I remember giving a presentation um, a while ago to the um, National Military Museum, Army Museum in London. Uh, and a former brigadier was in the audience, and he came up came up to me afterwards, um, British Army brigadier, and he said, um, "Funny you said all that stuff about Polish military planning prior to 1939, because we were always taught that they didn't plan at all." Mm. <laughs> Which yeah. they're still teaching that at Sandhurst. Then you know, crikey, they, that needs revising. Um, now the, the Poles have, you know, they as you said, they appreciate fully that they are in, you know, kind of the worst situation in the world, the worst position in the world because they're stuck between Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union. Uh, and both countries have aggressive designs on Polish territory, which goes back to what I was talking about before, about you know, yeah. the, 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 the rebirth of Poland in 1918, which is bloody on both sides. They both harbor um, territorial demands on Poland. Um, so they both um, you know, have uh, aggressive designs on that country. So Poland knows exactly what's going on there. It's, it's under no illusions. The, the problem it has fundamentally is that the economy in the interwar years has not been sufficiently robust that they can, um, you know, afford to mechanize to any any great degree. But there's, you know, Poland has the fifth largest standing army in the world at that point. It's larger than, you know, certainly larger than the British army. Um, so, you know, there, there's reason for them to be reasonably optimistic. They have, you know, some up to date tanks. They don't have enough. The problems are the problems are of um, of quantity. Primarily, they have some up-to-date tanks which would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Germans. They have some reasonably up-to-date aircraft, but not nowhere near enough. So it's really it's really quantity rather than quality, but but quality as well. Um, so they know that they, you know they've got a strategic plan for the, against the East, which is drawn up in the mid 1930s. You know, in the event of um, a Soviet invasion, and they have a strategic plan for the West. The problem is they can't they don't have the manpower or the equipment to to deal with both at the same time. Yeah. So in the run up to 1939, so once the, the Germans start sort of saber rattling in the in the spring of 39 and demanding sort of, you know, extraterritorial rights across the corridor and demanding Danzig and saying that should be our territory. And I mean, not that it was the Poles to give. It was uh, uh, League of Nations um, free state, of course. Um, but they're, they're agitating and they're, and they're radicalizing the, the German minorities. This was always the cat's paw. This is what the Germans did very well, and they did it very well in the example of Czechoslovakia in '38. So in the run-up to '38, they'd been systematically radicalizing. It's a great word that we would use now, but you know, pumping money in, pumping you know um, propaganda in, uh, 
um, into that German minority to make sure that they were, if not actively Nazi, then at least anti-Czech. So, you know, wanting wanting to have a sort of fundamental change. And they did the same thing with the German minority in Poland. So it's it tried and trust, tried and tested in 38. They did the same in 39. So this sort of saber rattling starts. And then, of course, the Czechs, the, the Poles, sorry, the Poles know that that's their primary threat. So they activate their sort of Western plan. Um, and key to all of this was help helped by the Western allies. So they're under no illusion that they, they can, you know, they think they they could make give a give a good account of themselves, um, but they're under no illusion about you know the, the prospect of of holding off a German attack is not going to happen unless the British and the French come in, and they come in in the West. Incidentally, there's no it's never expected that the British and the French would actually you know arrive in Poland unless of course there was talk in the mid in the mid 1939 of the British sending RAF squadrons to actually station them. Yeah in poland but that was kind of airy you know oh we could just do that and of course the poles take that as gospel that's going to happen and the british from the british perspective it was just a sort of an airy you know sort of semi-promise um one of the tragedies of of uh this whole episode is is actually the, the sort of the disconnect between what what the british and the french say is going to happen and all the help that's going to arrive um and of course it's all eyewash really um and and all this everything that they say that the, the polls kind of take as red and 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 accept that that's definitely going to happen so it's one of the tragedies of this is this mismatch in expectations um between the two sides well that's kind of a, a, a case in point in in that part of the war i mean the singapore plan the other side of the world for example is a, is a case of people's expectations down there not being actually matched by what actually ended up happening yeah. as a result of the promise so that is yeah. When we look back par for the course of the of the of the promises and it's we yeah. can kind of forgive them for being optimistic promises and it's the, the definition of what does a promise actually mean is it a, is it is it a commitment is it a is it a vague offer of assistance and and now we can look back and say yes yeah, some of these aren't really uh, yeah what yeah. they're, what they're right. to be. french in in may 1939 there's a meeting between the um i think it was the military attache in paris and uh um the french minister of war gamelin um where you know the, the the french commit at that meeting to you know sending the bulk of their forces the text was the bulk of french forces uh, against the western frontier of germany um after i think day 14 of mobilization um and that's a sort of solid commitment the british kind of in a sense thankfully because it's less embarrassing um, the British are not as precise in their in their commitment. So it's much more about, you know, we will we will assist Poland to, you know, um, in the event of foreign foreign invasion or foreign aggression, we will assist Poland to, to the greatest of our ability or whatever it is. It's something yeah. you know, some sort of diplomatic formula, which can be, you know, essentially argued away. But the French were much more specific in what they said they would do and what they would how they would respond. Um so the, the, you know, the Poles know that they can't stand alone against this. They they think they've secured uh, Western allies. They secure this alliance with the French. They uh, secure an alliance, military alliance with the British in August, on August 25th, two days after the Nazi-Soviet pact, incidentally, is signed. Um, so they think they're in a good position. Um, and they, they, you know, put their forces on the frontier, um, which again is sort of criticised in retrospect that, you know, you're up against, you know, the, the a nascent blitzkrieg, the beginnings of blitzkrieg. It's not really happening in a in a terribly coherent manner yet but the germans are much more motorized and, and mechanized than you are um you know on average i think i think the stats were a sort of german division has on average about a thousand vehicles um a polish division has about a hundred and everything else is done by horse and man uh, and that tells the story in itself you know that the, the, mm. the poles the germans even though mechanization is not yet complete even in german army it's much further advanced than it is um, for the Poles. So um, the Polish plan basically is to have those forces on the frontier um, so that when there is an invasion, it's, all, it's almost like Ukraine now, um, when there is an, an invasion or an incursion, um, they effectively act as a tripwire. So, you know, they will engage German forces and they will then retreat, effectively carry out a fighting retreat as quickly as possible to, to get back to sort of more defensible lines. And you can see on that map, You've just thrown up there, um, Paul. You can see that the, the river systems, the Vistula, yeah. the Narev, and so on. Those are quite crucial to Polish planning because they thought that 
um, the Vistula and the Nareth particularly um, as sort of large rivers could be could be useful sort of lines of defense because there's nothing else ge geographical that they could have used. Um, but they thought they could withdraw to some, some of the some more de more easily defensible lines in central Poland, having set the tripwire effectively. So the British and the French would come in, start causing havoc against Western Germany. The Germans would would pull units away from the Polish theater to deal with that threat. And they thought, you know, that that was a reasonable scenario that to them was strategically was was acceptable. And, um, and I would, sorry to interrupt, but that in well, that you, you talk about the correct the correct correct relationship Germany had, had with Poland through the 30s. Um, you know, we were talking with Helen yesterday about the exchange of students between Germany and Britain. So given that they are butted up to each other, Germany and Poland, had there been exchanges of kind of officers going across on exchange programs? Were the Polish aware of what the Germans were doing with their military and, and how they're developing their combined arms that we would now kind of refer to as the Blitzkrieg? Are they aware of it or is it all kind of when it all kicks off on September the 1st, sort of a surprise to them? I think they're aware of it in the same in the same way as as anyone else was aware of it that there's there's no real collaboration or cooperation going on between them. Um, you know they would have had you know um, diplomatic contacts and military attaches and all of that between them. So all of those normal diplomatic processes would have been going on, um, and it's quite normal for for military attaches to sort of observe maneuvers and things like that. Yeah. That's kind of that would be a normal thing. So they would have been certainly as aware as anyone else. But there's none of that cooperation that you had, for example, between Germany and the Soviet Union, which again is a, kind, a slightly unwritten chapter uh, in the history. Um, but again, Germany sought in those in the 1920s, particularly, but into the 1930s as well, to evade the restrict the military restrictions of their side by by doing all of its military testing for, for you know, the nascent tank arm, for example, in the 1920s in the Soviet Union. So they're sending all their, their specialists and, and they're testing out tank prototypes in the Soviet Union. And the same thing with poison gas and the same thing with aircraft, all of the things they're not allowed to use, according to Versailles, they're doing under Soviet auspices in the 1920s. So, you know, that doesn't that's not happening uh, in the German Polish relationship. But so they're, they understand to some extent, you know, the, 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 the threat they're under and the, and the, 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 the challenge that they face in 39, but but not really the chapter and verse of it, certainly. Uh, and this is, you know, we've just had a question there from from James about um. Uh, how did the Polish-Soviet war affect the planning and execution of the war in 1939? Well, but it's bringing this back, the fact, as we said earlier, they are between, between these two opposing empires that both yeah. want to kind of go, they're going to know that what what tactics you would employ against the Germans wouldn't necessarily work against the Soviets and vice versa. Yeah. And, and and especially, as you said, the nightmare scenario of having to do both at the same time would, would as we know, which pretty much turned out to be what happened, is that yeah. it's, it's a very, very difficult position to be in, to be facing two different armies with different backgrounds, different doctrines coming from different directions over different terrain. Um, it's a lot. And a nation that, as you said, has really only established itself over the last two or two two decades, yeah. to try and manage and hold off all that, it hasn't even got its its lo its kind of longevity of of infantry schools and military schools. It's it's all coming at this with with very little um, back history to draw on, apart from those re you know we talked about those kind of recent you know the uprising type events of the nineteen twenties and but they're not really enough to compare against a full scale invasion. So. They're dealing with lots of competing factors in a, in a, in and it's a it's a really difficult situation they're in. That's a terribly it's, understated way of saying it, but it is it's a it is. A, I mean that that and that question about 1920 is actually really a really pertinent one because there's this sort of joke in military circles where you say you know every army is 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 forever planning for the last war that it fought. Yeah, right. Um, and that's exactly what Poland is doing in 19 in 1939. So, as I said, it's a large army in in, glo in, in global terms. It's reasonably well armored. It's reasonably well numbered. It's got a reasonable air force, all of that. But of course, you know, they're up against, you know, the German, the Wehrmacht, which is, you know, the, the most advanced military force on the planet in 1939. So, you know, that that disparity is something we have to bear in mind. But there's a there's deeper sort of cultural problems as well. You just mentioned the thing about sort of traditions and having those sort of, you know, if you like a, a military um, um, infrastructure, yeah. which takes time to create and takes time to get the traditions and all that. Poland has an added problem or problems, one of which is that their experience at the end of the First World War was not one necessarily of armor so the british and the french and the germans 
all saw on the Western Front the, the benefits of armor at the end of the First World War. So that's why you get people like, um, uh, I think it's RJC Fuller, for example, um, RFC Fuller it is, isn't it? RFC Fuller, the great sort of, you know, tank ideologue yeah. in the British Army, who most of his ideas weren't really taken seriously. But Guderian in Germany, who is the great sort of apostle of, of tank warfare in, in Germany. Um, and, um, you know, they're sort of moving, admittedly, comparatively slowly. The Germans much faster, but they can kind of see the future and they can see that it's probably going to be tank based and it's going to be mechanized. Um, but for the Poles, they, they they didn't really experience that. So their experience at the end of the end of the First World War was um, that sort of insurrectionist warfare, like I described. And then it's also this very peculiar war, which is which is worthy of study, really, um, for all those watching. Um, that rather peculiar war against the Soviets, the Polish-Soviet War, which is very mobile. It's going across vast dis distances across terrain where there's hardly any sort of finished roads there's certainly there's very little in the way of railways and it's a war of cavalry um mm. and armored trains so where there are railways they have these armored trains which you know form a you know a sort of mobile fortress almost so it's it's a it's a war of cavalry and armored trains right this is the both polish bolshevik war so in a sense that almost becomes the sort of kudos that becomes the you know, ethos rather the ethos of the polish army so they go into 1939 with with a good number of armored trains which mm. to us is kind of something almost you know it's anti-diluvian it's like so so, so out, outdated by 1939 and of course the dreaded cavalry so you know cavalry is still you know the the creme de la creme of military service from for the poles it's what your, your young young aristocrat would go into the uh, cavalry service and he'd have a lovely horse and a stable and and all of his equipment and all the necessary training and, and he'd be a very pinnacle of society and those people because of their social and political power didn't want to let go of that they didn't so there's a sort of a dead weight that that prevents the the ongoing ethos of mechanization taking hold which it does in Poland. i mean they've got they've got hundreds of tanks in 39 they're, they're not necessarily a good enough standard but they've got hundreds of tanks it's coming they know it's coming but there's a sort of dead weight against it which is both it both a sort of social dead weight and it's also that military ethos that they're looking back and saying well you know we defeated the red army with cavalry and and uh, and, and armored trains in 1920 so why do we need tanks right yeah. so there's that ethos as well so there's all sorts of things sort of feeding into this sort of mentality the poles actually they go into the, the 1939 a lot of them quite optimistic and saying you know we'll see you in berlin so they're not thinking that they're going to get a pasting that they that they end up getting yeah and and trent Alenko made the point they're on the wrong side of radio technology which we could be say the same as Absolutely. the french yeah. exactly the same in 1940 and we when we're going off in a rabbit hole now but when we talk that, about the as a tank that, 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 that was a fu fundamental problem um yeah. was was you know that again goes back to pilsudski as well they had this sort of culture of of um uh secrecy within the army um so much so that you know neighboring units at the front in 1939 they couldn't communicate directly with one another they had to communicate via the high command yeah and of course if you know you the, everything behind you has been bombed to buggery by the stukas and the high command has already fled to to brest litovsk which it had on on the 8th of september then you literally cannot communicate with the unit that's that's on your flank which is a fundamental problem right so there, there's there's all sorts of other elements that that kind of hamstring any effective polish defense even if it were possible yeah and it, it, yeah when we again when we talk about armor it's not the use of armor so much as the as the coordination and communications between armor yeah. that's what sets apart the successful uh, actions of the of the 1939-40 it's it's everything working together coordinated that makes such a difference but let's get that, let's take it back to this situation now this is this is from this these map i got from 1930 american made map so this is the this is m day and then, then there's the, the the German the actual German plans and then what the Polish actually did. So you talk about this idea of they're using rivers and there's kind of the the the, the tripwire effect and then there's the, the the fallback and reserves. Well, without going into huge amounts of military detail because that's not what we're here to discuss tonight. You know, kind of run us through what the expectations the Polish had and the and the reality of what happened when the Germans crossed the border. Yeah, I mean that that map is interesting because that that is obviously a contemporary one. It's yeah, it's, it's a little bit simplified and not quite, but yeah. Um, as you can see, you know, Germ Poland is effectively in the in the jaws of a German pincer before a shot is fired, as I said before. So in a geostrategic sense, it's about as bad as it gets. Um, 
the main thrusts of the German attack, incidentally, go. Um, if you can bring that up again, Paul. Sorry, I'll bring, I'll bring, I'll bring, actually, I'll bring that your one in there because we've got that one. As yeah, well. that's a bit. That one's a bit better. So the main thrusts are, as you can see from that, across from go from the north, north to south. So across from uh, Pomerania, across the Polish corridor eastward, uh, and then from from East Prussia downwards, sort of straight down to Warsaw. That's actually the shortest route to get to Warsaw. And obviously your, your primary intention is to knock out your enemy's capital, right? So that's that's one main route down. But the Poles had actually put a lot of a lot of um, um, fortifications on that route, expecting that particular line of attack. Um, so that wasn't a particularly happy uh, line of approach for the Germans. So the main thrust actually comes from Silesia, which is that, you know, the, the, the lower jaw of the pincer, um, again, heading up uh, northeast towards Warsaw. That became the main thrust. Um, and there's another thrust from further down, actually from um, Slovakia, and Slovak troops actually participate, about 50,000 Slovak troops participate on the German side, incidentally. Uh, there's another thrust, which is the Polish uh, German 14th Army, um, which drives basically due east towards uh, towards Lvov. Um, so those are the, the sort of four main thrusts of the, of the uh, German advance. And the main one is that um, coming up from Silesia up towards, towards Warsaw, and those forces um, reach Warsaw already on the evening of the 8th of September. So already within just over a week, um, they've reached the capital. Though they are then uh, withdrawn. So those just the spearheads sort of get to the suburbs of Warsaw. Um, and they are then uh, withdrawn because of the, you know, the most um, salient, using that word, the most salient uh, engagement of, of this whole campaign was, was called the, the Battle of the Bzura, um, which some of our, our viewers might have heard of. Um, and the Bzura happens because, as you can see from that um, that map, there's a whole section in you know that the, the bit of Poland that's furthest to the west, furthest to the left. There's a big sort of lump of Polish territory, which is just kind of bypassed by German forces. Hmm. So that you've got the the, the 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 that I think it was the Fourth Army is advancing across the corridor uh, uh, west to east, and you've got the German Tenth Army in the south, which is advancing up from Silesia up towards. Warsaw, and you've got a huge swathe of Polish territory which is untouched. So uh, already, sort of early on, there's those there's an army there, a whole army there, Polish army, which is which is unengaged by the Germans, and it's under a chap called Kucheba, who's a very capable general, uh, and he basically was petitioning the high command in vain because the high command had already buggered off, and as I said, the communications were dreadful. Um, so he's petitioning the high command and saying, "Look, I can attack the Germans in the flank here." Um, cause my army is untouched. We haven't been engaged and, you know, we're, we're ready to go and, and we can see it. We can see that elsewhere things are going badly. So he wanted to get into the fight and he'd got no reply. So he ended up just doing it anyway. Uh, and the battle of the Bzura, which is basically him attacking, you know, southeastward towards that flank of the 10th army attacking, uh, Warsaw, um, was the sort of major engagement on, of that whole campaign. And it's a battle that lasts, you know, for about sort of five or six days in total. It's quite a remarkable story in itself, but as we know, I mean, they, they couldn't sustain. Yeah. Uh, they made some advances, but they couldn't be sustained against against the the overwhelming uh, firepower of the of the Germans. Yeah. So I'm just going to remind folks, that, of course, for more in a in a proper old plug here, holding up my copy of the book. There, of course, lots more detail about this in First to Fight, and this is not the only book Roger has written about the Polish situation in the early part of the war, but that's the got the most recent one and a good read. But in, in, going, we're going away from the history to more writing about history now. When you know, when as you have done, you're writing about, you're explaining us there the attacks, the columns coming in there. How difficult is it to keep away from falling into the trap of trying to go into what they should have done, what they could have done? Because it's already happened in the sidebar. It happens when we talk about France in 1940. Everyone starts coming in, of course, and it's all we all do it ourselves. We should have done that. Why don't they hold the line there? If only they'd use there. And if they, we all yeah. do that there. So when you're putting this sort of stuff down on paper, do you have to kind of discipline yourself not to go down that revisionist Monday morning quarterbacking? Um, I, was, I don't. I don't want to sort of say the wrong thing here, but that, that is, um, it's natural. That's what we do, right? We, yeah. We're always saying, "What if you know this hadn't happened?" and you know, it's kind of a it's a parlor game that w anyone with an interest in history, you know, you you give them a pint of beer and put them in a room together, they'll come up with various fan counterfactuals of you know what would have happened if and blah blah blah. It's just what we do. Um, but that 
fundamentally kind of isn't how we do history. I mean, as I said before, yeah. we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the people there and explain things as they saw it and, and explain things not as they should have done it, but at what they actually did, right? Um, so I understand the sort of impulse to see things in that way, but that's not how, you know, fundamentally how we do history. So, you know, the great challenge for me really um, is, is or w with this book, was essentially to find as many contemporary accounts as possible. Um, I'm, I'm not really, I should sort of say, Paul, I'm not really a military historian. Um, no, yeah, it's, not it's the first time I'd done military history. Um, and I sort of came at it in a, in a slightly tangential way because I thought, well, I, a lot of a lot of military history and apologies to those that, you know, really, you know, buy it in bulk and, and love it. I mean, that's great. But a lot of it, I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily read very well. Um, it's kind of quite clunky. It's very obsessed with detail that, you know, um, the non-military historian just finds a bit a bit extraneous and unnecessary. You know, that's sort of the, the the line that you can. I always use this line. You know, the um, the the uh, the fourth battalion of the three hundred and fifty third regiment advanced at dawn on the on the on the uh, morning of the third of May. Um, you know, uh, three three hundred uh, or twenty miles along the line of the river, whatever. You know, that's kind of an opening paragraph of a military history. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, chapter, and. Um, to me, that's that's kind of it's too much irrelevant information. I'm not really interested in what which battalion it was. I'm more interested in in reading about what people thought they were doing and reading their diary entries, you know. Mm -hmm. And and it's that sort of human element that I'm more interested in. Um, so I kind of rationalise it to myself to say, well, I, I wasn't writing a military history. I was writing a sort of a, a human history of a military campaign in a way, you know. Um, so I sort of went about trying to find all those accounts. And the, and the difficult bit really was the Polish side, um, because where this has been written about at all in the sort of Western narrative, it's used German accounts and used yeah. German contemporary you know, stuff like Kuderi and, you know, Hans von Lutzk, that sort of thing, um, which is all good and good and right. But a lot of that also actually incidentally shades into propaganda. There's a couple of accounts that were published in 1940, which are very sort of shameless propaganda accounts that, you know, talk about the sort of effortless supremacy of the Germans and the, and the uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, how dreadful the Poles were in sort of attacking them in the rear and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's clearly sort of colored by the con contemporary propaganda. So I, I wanted to find Polish accounts to see what they thought they were doing, um, how they viewed the war, and then the next and then the next challenge as well was to talk about the Soviet invasion, which doesn't really get a look in in the Western narrative at all. The Soviets are sort of, you know, are, uh, they've successfully airbrushed themselves out of this history. And I'm, I'm trying to sort of in vivid colors, trying to paint them back into it because they belong in it. Um, but they obviously the, the collaboration between Hitler and Stalin between 1939 and 41 um, is embarrassing. And of course, so, you know, post war, post 1941 even. Um, the Kremlin was busy trying to distance itself from its former ally, uh, and to uh, and to say that well, you know, everything that we did was purely to hold hold off an inevitable attack and all the rest of it. You know, you'll hear. I know you've got some um, uh, Ian coming in later this week. Talking yeah, on about Friday, him. talking about that specifically. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which would be very interesting. And 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 he understands it. It's it's a, it's an I've written about the Nazi Soviet Pact as well. And it's um, it's a subject that really isn't understood at all well in the Western narrative of the war, um, and it needs to be better understood. And I know because I've I've read his book, and I know he understands it very well. So that you know, I would uh, urge all of our, our viewers today to to yeah, tune no, in. that's going to be a great show. Um, um, so important. I'm I'm aware of we've got some questions coming in there, and we're you know we're showing the map that we've covered to some extent, the German movements, we're going to bring in the Soviet movements as well there, which, and we, we talked earlier about the, uh, the, the, the French and, and British promises, quote unquote, to assist in this situation. So it's a kind of a two part question from Rick Chain here. So when Germany attacked Poland, the allies immediately declared war against Germany. And then a short time later, two weeks, the USSR attacked Poland, but there was no declaration of war against the USSR. Why? Now, I know that's a big, a big question. It kind of touches in this, the pact we just talked about, but it, it we will. We need to go through this. The fact that two weeks later the Soviets attacked, well, yeah. a few days later the Soviet attacked there. But have you got a response to that that we can kind of yeah. do without without going down too much of a tangent? No, uh, that, that's it's good. I mean, there's, it, it, there's a couple of points there. The first point, I know that I know the point that he's asking about why why the British and the French didn't declare war on the on the Soviets, yeah. which I'll come to at the end. 
But it's interesting that, you know, the Nazi Soviet pact, as you'll hear, you know, contains within it a secret protocol um, where Hitler and Stalin, and or through their proxies, Molotov and Ribbentrop, uh, effectively divide up Central Europe between them. And they say, in the event of a political reorganization, that's the phrase that's used, they both know that something big is coming, right? They don't know exactly what it's going to be. Certainly the Soviets don't, but, you know, there's a good chance that there's going to be war. So there's this idea in the event of a political reorganization, this is the line of the sphere of influence between German sphere of influence and the Soviet sphere of influence. Sphere of influence. And they basically draw a line down the central Poland. It's slightly to the west of that green line. That's the, that's the partition line that they decide on later on. Um, so it's it's further to the west because it actually yeah, runs yeah. up the, um, the 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 line that they agree actually runs up through the uh, along the Vistula and actually would have yeah, divided yeah. Warsaw in two, for example. So uh, it was slightly to the west of that, um, and that's the secret protocol, which is crucially important because it leaves the Baltic states, for example, in the Soviet zone. It leaves the uh, pro provinces of Romania in the Soviet zone. It leaves Finland in the Soviet zone. So this is a very blatant, you know, divvy up of of Central Europe between the two um and uh so that's what is essentially you know expected on both sides when the germans invade they're kind of expecting the poles the, the soviets to come in uh, more or less straight away um but stalin's a bit cannier than that so a lot of the a lot of the diplomat and I, I i detail this in the book a mm. lot of the um um diplomatic traffic between between berlin and, and moscow uh, in that period is the germans basically saying um, you know things are going well. When are you when are you coming in? When are you come joining us in this venture? Um, expecting that the Red Army will be there invading, right? Um, Stalin's as I, Stalin, as I say, is much much cannier than that. He knows that too close an association with Hitler is pretty politically toxic. Um, so he's keeping Hitler to some extent at arm's length, or certainly his 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 alliance inverted commas with Hitler at arm's length. He says, well, you know, time is not right. We're mobilizing. They've got all of these excuses that they throw up. Um, they then sort of have large scale exercises, which is the Soviet way. And that's, that's what they do now. They have You notice they're having exercises yeah, yeah. Um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the frontiers of Ukraine. This is always the prelude to something big. So I hope it's not now, but historically it doesn't look good. So they do that as well. So there's large scale exercises on the, um, on the Polish frontier. And um, and they eventually come in. They create this propaganda narrative. Incidentally, they create a propaganda narrative, which is that the Polish state is collapsing, and we are going in to uh, assist the Pol uh, the the Belarusian and Ukrainian populations uh, in you know finding their feet in that collapsing state. Essentially, so they they dress up what they're doing in propaganda terms. As a humanitarian operation again that might sound familiar to a few people um <laughs> it's very this is the kremlin playbook i mean it's it's as old as the hills and it, it just works it's very good and you can see it working today um so that's how they dress it up the invasion happens on the 17th of september they actually said to said to the germans they say you tell us when warsaw is going to fall and when warsaw falls that's when we're invade because they want to they want to sort of stick with that narrative that you know the Polish state has collapsed. Therefore, you know chaos has ensued, and we're coming in to to sort it out, right? Humanitarian operation. Um, so the, the the Germans say to them, you know, a couple of days before they say Warsaw is likely to fall in the next few days because they besieged Warsaw. Warsaw held out until, um, from memory, off the top of my head, I think the twenty eighth of September. So, but they went prematurely. So the Germans said it's likely to fall in a couple of days. The, the Red Army then is told to invade, and it's a it's a pure military operation. So the idea that this is humanitarian in any way is is eyewash. It's propaganda eyewash. Yeah. Um, it's a military operation. Half a million men, you know, two and a half thousand tanks, four thousand aircraft. The the instruction they're given is to destroy Polish forces in a lightning strike. Blitzkrieg, right? Uh, so it's absolutely a military operation. Um, and they're expecting to. You know just sort of ride on the back of this propaganda narrative that poland's collapsed but poland you know warsaw didn't fall for another nearly two weeks remarkably um next question that we come to is so this that's one aspect is this sort of this this relationship between the two and it is a great power relationship you'll, you'll hear about it yeah. on friday it is a great power relationship between between germany and the soviet union for those nearly two years and it's the it's the great power relationship of world war ii 
that everyone else in the world seems to have forgotten about. Yeah. But we really shouldn't. We need to understand it and we need to understand what they were doing together because they were doing stuff together. You know, there's there's huge amounts of economic um, goods going in both directions and and four economic treaties and all of that stuff. It's a, it's an active collaboration. Um, and yet it's been, you know, effectively whitewashed out of history. Um, so that's one aspect. So, that, that, you know, it's the Germans saying, when are you coming in? And then trying to time the Soviets, trying to time it right for propaganda purposes and essentially getting it slightly wrong, but then subsequently managing to white, whitewash themselves out of history. The other question, which is, that's a very long prelude to answering the actual question, which is why there was no declaration of war by the Bush and the French on the Soviets. Now, if you go back to the Anglo-Polish military agreement, 25th of August, 1939, which comes two days after the Nazi-Soviet pact, incidentally, the text of that is quite vague. And it says that if Poland is um, subjected to um, uh, foreign aggression, or so, that's a, it's quite a vague term. Um, again, the text is in the book. It doesn't specify uh, who the aggressor should be. It just talks about foreign aggression. Um, so that is the root of the confusion, because people think, well, you know, we declared war on the Germans for their aggression. Why didn't we declare war on the Soviets? Because they did the same thing, right? And the question was asked in the House of Commons, even uh, in September 39, because this was something that, that uh, you know, contemporaries then um, asking, yeah. question as well, right? So it's quite an obvious thing. The answer to it, and this is the answer given in, in the House of Commons as well, was that there was a secret protocol to the Anglo-Polish military agreement, which specified that you know the aggressor that we're talking about in the public text of this arrangement is Germany. So it sort of stipulated that we're only talking about Germany, guys. Don't don't think we're going to go, you know, declaring war on anybody else. This policy does not cover you in another disaster. Exactly. It's, yeah. Exactly. Mm. It's a it's an insurance disclaimer. <laughs> uh, this policy does not cover perfect. Yeah. No, it's exactly that. So, I mean, as I said, the question was asked in 1939 as well. And it still gets asked today whenever I do sort of talks about this stuff. You know, it's, it's, someone will always ask that question. And I understand why, but the, it's, that's the simple answer. Yeah, and and you know we're we're coming up. We're talking about the sidebar now. We're talking about the Nazi-Soviet pact, and again, we are going to be discussing that with Ian on Friday. But the, as we're coming towards the end of this now, what I want to kind of bring up now is this fact that we Westerners are tending to gloss over this whole period, not pay enough attention to it. I mean, me living in France is another whole rabbit hole here. But when we talk about the Soviet-German pact, just the, the resistance efforts in France, you know, the communist resistance are waiting until that. Pact. We forget how significant the communist yeah. faction of France was, who are waiting for that deal to. Well, they can't do anything while that deal is is in place. And as, yeah. as someone living in France, it's it's integral to understanding the resistance role in France is understanding that pact first, because everything changes once Barbarossa happens. So, absolutely, there's another reason why it's important. But yeah. to sum things up, because otherwise we could be here all night. You know, <laughs> you, you are a main. Uh, one well, of the main guys trying to get us to understand Polish history in 1939 and and from Poland's point of view not just the, the comments in the side Barolina is joining and others saying of course when the Soviets talk about moving into Poland they're talking about it in liberation terms which you're saying there they're they're using entirely different sets of language than we're yeah. using tonight so they're a lot cleverer in the in you know yeah. German the German approach at the time and you know was was brute force, whereas the, 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 the Soviet approach was much more nuanced. The end result was the same, incidentally, but it had a sort of propaganda overlay of which was very, very nuanced and very subtle. And, and that sort of enabled them, as I said, I've said a couple of times, to effectively whitewash themselves out of history. Yeah. So it was very clever. I mean, yeah, again, people are saying that, yeah, that it's not the people who are reading this, they're saying it's not whitewashed out, but it depends what you read, it depends which group of readers of history you're talking about. There are lots of people who will follow my channel and who read your books who are widely read and have read yeah. a lot about the Eastern Front. And you know, we did a show about Turkey's neutrality a few weeks ago. But there are a lot of people who just read kind of the, the what I would call the kind of Stephen Ambrose version of things, which is the Americanized, Britishized version of things who just yeah. don't pay any attention to this at all. And, and it's all just picking up the events from when their own nations get involved. But mm -hmm. I want to kind of just bring up, you know, they have this image here of the, of the now partitioned Poland, which is another simple way of saying, 
of explaining this this balancing act of Soviet and Germany, and, and then as you say yourself earlier, the Poland within it has these different communities, and we've talked about, we could go off on a tangent and talk about what the fate of the Jewish Pol Poles and what have you, but summarize really, you know, the end of 19, well, in fact, there were different partitions. By October 1939, this is how it's going to be for the next couple of years. So yeah. what situation is Poland in now? How, how are they... I mean, it's, it's a crass question to ask again because they've, they've been occupied by two nations. But what what sort of summarise it for us? OK, um, the easiest the easiest way to start is to look at the, the Soviet zone. So you can yep. see that sort of dark line through the middle, the dark squiggle. Um, that's what they called the boundary of peace, which became a Soviet German frontier, um, which was slightly uneasy. But it, it still sort of functioned broadly for, for most of that period. Um, those territories you can see to the east of that line, um, the northern sector, there's this, another squiggly line that you can see. The northern yeah. sector of that is annexed directly to um, the Belarusian Republic, Belarusian Soviet Republic. And then to the south of that, um, that area is annexed directly to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. And they do that already in, in October 1939. So it's very quickly done. Um, there's then a sort of a thoroughgoing sifting and sorting of the populations. Um, so you have these sort of red militias that go around sort of pointing out, you know, uh, Polish um, landowners or Polish uh, uh, people who'd been ad administrators of the, of the former regime or or um, army officers or whatever. Those people tend to get picked up, interrogated. Um, a vast numbers of them end up in Siberia and Kazakhstan in the gulags and the, and the forced labor camps. You know, upwards of a million people are deported from those two provinces, two areas of eastern Poland into the depths of the Soviet Union um, to a, many cases to an uncertain fate. Uh, and that's a story that we don't know enough about as well. And we and we really should in the Western narrative. Um, and essentially that, you know, they, those areas are thoroughly Soviet Sovietized, thor thoroughly communized. Um, as I said, there's a there's a uh, a class sifting going on. You have a racial sifting in the in the German zone, and you have a class sifting in the east. So if you're a if you're a sort of indigent, semi-educated peasant, you're probably going to be okay. Uh, if you're an educated um, nobleman who happens to be picked up by the Soviets, you're probably going to be. If you're lucky, you'll be deported to Siberia. If you're not lucky, you get a bullet in the head. So it's it's quite a brutal um, class sorting. So the you know communist revolution comes red in tooth and claw uh, already in the autumn of 1939 to those two two areas. Heading to the west beyond that black line, you've got um, the Polish corridor. Obviously, is annexed directly. The area um, just to the south of that, the area to the south of East Prussia as well, is annexed directly to the German Reich. So I think you can see it just there. There's a dotted line that you can see that is from Warsaw which is in the, almost in the middle towards the mm. top of that map. There's a dotted line just above it, which kind of goes west and then turns yep. south. And it comes right the way down. Krakow is down at the south. Um, that that sort of teardrop shape in the middle um, is is what becomes known in German as the general government or the general gouvernement. Um, everything to the west of that is annexed directly to the Reich and becomes Reich territory. The general government is used. It's completely under German control, incidentally. It's run by Hitler's former lawyer, Hans Frank, who's a rather brutal, rather stupid man, actually, but a very brutal man. Um, and it's entirely, you know, uh, under German command, but it's used kind of like a racial dumping ground. So while you've got a class sorting in the east, you've got a brutal race sorting in the west. Um, and in those areas annexed directly to the Reich, um, you know, if you if you happen to be um, Polish or Jewish in there, the chances are you'll probably be deported initially into the general government. They actually deported Jews very often across the frontier of peace, in inverted commas, into the Soviet Union. So they're, they're saying, like, go to your go to your sort of, you know, Jew friend brothers. That's the line they used to use. Mm. You know? And they'd literally throw them over that frontier and say, you know, go over there. That's where you belong. It didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough times. Um, so the, the general government is kind of used as a dumping ground, a racial dumping ground, effectively. Um, but in those areas, there is initially a, uh, a sort of deliberate decapitation of Polish society. So the same thing is happening in the East. You have this deliberate decapitation of Poland, of Polish society. So, you know, if you're an MP, if you're a doctor, if you're a, a priest, if you're a lawyer, anyone with an education, a landowner, nobleman, again, chances are 
you'll get a bullet in the head. You know, there's a sort of large scale sifting of population. And it, um, and then actually only later on, really, under the German zones, do they kind of shift their focus more towards the Jews. So there's this initial, you know, corralling of the Jews into ghettos because it's kind of a holding pen. They don't know what yet to do with them. You know, the idea of the Holocaust is one that, as the name suggests, the euphemistic name they gave it, the final solution of the Jewish question. Mm. They're just kind of addressing the Jewish question at this point. They don't know what to do yet, right? One of the things that we don't really um, appreciate, I think, in this narrative is that one of the great results, one of the biggest results of the German invasion of Poland in 39 is that Hitler inherits a large-scale Jewish problem, in inverted commas. Because, the, as I said at the top, the, the Jewish population of Germany, you know, that problem, in inverted commas, had almost been solved by forcing immigration, by, you know, uh, creating creating a situation where those German Jews wanted to leave Germany, and many of them did. But then he inherits three million Polish Jews. What the hell are you going to do mm. with them? That creates this Polish, or uh, sorry, the Jewish question. So initially, ghettoization, you know, with the logic that, you know, we've got Holocaust Memorial Day tomorrow, so it's worth mentioning. Yeah, ghettoization is a sort of temporary policy. If you if you concentrate those large numbers of people in in very small areas and often in the worst areas of towns and cities, I you know, look, for example, the example of Warsaw, which had a huge Jewish population, about 30 percent of the population of Warsaw was Jewish. But when they set up the ghetto, they set up um, the ghetto in three percent of the area of Warsaw. So you've got 30 percent of the population in three percent of the area. Right. You can imagine what conditions are like. So, they, you know, they're, they're banking on the fact that maybe half of these people will die by the time they actually have to do anything with them. Mm. So it's a very brutal policy. So but initially, that's all kind of a little bit in the future. They start ghettoization already in 39. It gets into its swing in 1940. Warsaw Ghetto is established uh, in the autumn of 1940, for example. Initially, there's this as I said, decapitation of Polish society, sifting of Polish society. So Poland is supposed, and there's agree agreement between um, Berlin and Moscow saying, you know, Poland will never rise again. So this is a fourth partition. We talked about the partitions at the top as well. Yeah. Three partitions in the late 18th century. Poland is wiped from the map. This is a fourth partition, right? Berlin and Moscow saying Poland will never rise again. You know, these people are going to be our, effectively our slaves, right? So that's the intention. That's the intention in 1939. Uh, it's a great summary. And, and a couple of points that Thomas has made is obviously, you know, that, that studying this, writing about this, reading about it, place names, are, not only are the borders changing, place names are changing. Yeah. They're going from Polish to German and some are going from Polish to, to, to Russian. And, and so we're searching it, you, you know, it, it can be problematic. I just had to do some text for a book on photos and you had to decide with the publisher, are we going to use, which which language are we going to use? Yeah. Which term are we, are we, are we going to specify each time we mention a city? This is the time, what it was called then, but it was changed again two years later. Well, it gets complicated. And the other thing yeah. I, about your saying is, is everything that starts here the 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 we're going back to the, the armor rolling over the border from 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 germany the air attacks the bombing and then it, we're talking about this the, the ghettoization and the and the splitting of populations awful dramatic terrible but of course as the war went on it happened much on much larger scales elsewhere which means that we now 17 80, 80 years on are feeling that these events are smaller, so therefore they're not drawing our attention because everything escalates. When we talk about Barbarossa, you know, the, the, the massacre by bullets that happened there, it dwarfed what had been happening in Poland. The, the tank battles dwarfed what happened in Poland. So if, if the war had stopped in the end of 1939, we'd still, all of us, be talking about Poland. Yeah. But because it got bigger elsewhere, this has kind of just fallen through the cracks a bit, and it's tragic yeah. that it has. It's absolutely right. I mean, it, it, there's there's so many sort of preludes in 1939 to what to what happens later on. You look at Bre yeah. at um, uh, Blitzkrieg, for example. I mean, Blitzkrieg, as I said, is is an is an incomplete science in uh, in 39. But but you know they're doing it enough to 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 know that it kind of works. They do it more effectively in 1940. They do it really really well in 1941, right? But Blitzkrieg is kind of trialed here, you know, to some extent. You've got that sort of deliberate targeting of of, of um, uh, civilian populations, which you don't really get anywhere else. I mean, there's there's the, the atrocities committed by the Germans uh, in their campaign alone during the military phase. So the military phase ends on the sixth of sixth of October, 
So it's only five weeks. But alone in that period, there's over 600 massacres of POWs and civilians. Yeah. So it's, it's unbelievably brutal. And you don't see that in the West in 1940. You just don't, right? Because there's, there's an Eastern way of making war and there's a Western way of making war. And it's all fundamentally about, you know, do, is, your, is your opponent racially worthy of your respect? Are they worthy of living? Yeah. And they consider the French and the British to be worthy of living. So they don't tend to massacre POWs. Or they do in a couple mm. of occasions, but generally they don't. In, in Poland, it, it's kind of run of the mill to massacre yeah. people. Normal, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's just normal procedure, as it is after 1941 when they invade the Soviet Union. So there's an Eastern yeah. method of war. So there are so many things that are kind of preluded in the September campaign that, as you said, absolutely rightly, Paul, because it happens on a much bigger scale after 41, you know, Poland kind of gets forgotten, doesn't become part of the narrative. But we, you know, we kind of forget this at our peril. And the last point I'll make on this is, you know, bear in mind as well, in a, on a human scale, the, um, the September campaign, that five week period, um, the Polish death or the total death toll of that, of that, uh, those military campaigns and all of those massacres is upwards of 200,000 it, yeah. in some estimate. And it is an estimate. Um, it's up to 250,000, a quarter of a million men, women and children, which is huge. Mm. Right. Compare that to the French campaign, which I, from memory is about sort of, you know, 90,000 total. It's, it's it's it dwarfs it. And it's that brutality that yeah. puts that figure so high. You know, the Germans lost only 16,000 men, but they managed to kill however many yeah. you know, tens upon tens upon tens of thousand uh, POWs, soldiers, civilians. And everyone else in the process. And I was going to ask you, Roger, you know, why we should be studying this, but we've answered that ourselves by saying, as you said, there, this preludes everything that happens later on. The tank battles get bigger, the massacres get bigger, the the blitzkrieg gets bigger. And when we talk about blitzkrieg as a concept, we kind of start from well, when they attacked France in 1940, where we should go back to 39. We talk about the the, the what the the Germans did moving east, and we talk about it, you know, from Barbarossa. But we should be going back to Poland there. So we've answered why it should be talked about. So to to, to answer my question or ask my question a different way, you know, we're talking about Ian Johnson coming on on Friday and yourself and your work there. Are we, do we think, on the brink of a new phase where we will be putting more of a spotlight on, on, on this part? Because Poland bridges the gap between kind of the Western way of fighting and the Eastern way of fighting. It's the, it's the bridge between those two theatres in many ways. And now we have access to archives and even simple things like the fact we can use our phones to, to, to translate from German to English or Polish. Does that herald a good era coming up? You know, are you hope confident that the people you've taught and you've spoken to in 10 and 20 years time will be bringing more of this through in a much more accessible way? So we will put Poland back in yourself and Alina and, and others writing as well. Is Are we on the brink of something exciting? Um, I hope so. And I'd like to think so. I mean, there's always a risk of, you know, when you're in something, it's not the best place to sort of view it from, if you know what I mean. If you're in the eye of the storm, you can't really appreciate um you know how big the storm is for example um so there's that element that you kind of kid yourself that you're on the on a, on a wave and maybe you're not but um i think you know there are other other factors that i think are quite important in this and one of which of course is that um the polish historiography on this um really has been ignored for far too long yeah and that's partly to do with communist poland obviously up to 1989 there was there were sort of subjects that were taboo in communist Poland, not least the Katyn massacres, which I'm sure all our, all our viewers know about. Yeah, of course. But that was a taboo subject. You couldn't talk about it, you know, in 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 the public sphere in, in communist Poland. So, you know, that's a good example of a story that, you know, became very obviously public in Poland and outside, you know, because the, the, the Soviets admitted it under Gorbachev at the end of 1990. They admitted it as a Soviet crime. Um, so, and release documents and the rest of it, which they still they still sometimes hold back and, and sort of fudge this. But, you know, they, they fundamentally admitted responsibility. And you can extrapolate from that and talk about, you know, the other black spots of Polish history at the time, um, like the Polish Soviet war that we talked about in 1990, yeah. That wasn't allowed to be talked about under communist Poland. Um, the Soviet invasion of Poland in 39 was a black spot. You couldn't talk about that. That didn't exist. So all of this stuff, you know, there's a long lag. There's a long a long sort of lag to make up because you know the historic historiography of the rest of the war had a sort of 40 year head start and yeah. a lot of historians um their first go-to is what's been written about this before 
and that sort of dictates your tram lines that says this is what this is the narrative i'm going to follow and i'll use a few other little sources and a few first-hand accounts just to liven it up and judge it up a bit but essentially that's what i'm going to do so a lot of history unfortunately it's kind of regurgitative right yeah um, what we need to do is actually try and rethink some of this stuff and take take notice of this new historiography and take notice of those new resources and actually see things in a different way and sort of challenge ourselves to say well you know how is the old historiography actually rather misleading and how can we how can we improve it and bring other factors in and that's and what and I fundamentally Roger, to, to, to be excited about it i mean it's, it's like when you're at school learning some of the maths you're learning you yeah. know you should need it but it's actually painful to learn it you know you're trying to learn long yeah, division right. or whatever it is and and just because we say we should be talking about poland in 1939 and 1940 and it's in and its entire war some people have got to be excited enough to do that work to present it in a way people like alina that we you know we both count as a friend there and you know, i'm a particular fan of on a slight tangent now the comic writer garth ennis a northern irish writer who lives in he lives in the states and writes comic but writes the punisher and the boys mm -hmm. and he writes brilliant graphic novels and he's always looking for angles he writes a lot about the eastern front he writes about poland he writes about the spanish civil war i've got right just arrived in the post today his book johnny red about you know soviet pilots and it needs people like that to make these stories okay they're dramatic okay there's lots of you know shooting down aircraft but it makes it exciting and yeah. when Alina talks about Poland in in in, in the Warsaw Uprising, whatever, she she's excited by talking about it, and therefore we as listeners, viewers, readers are excited by it, and we're excited when I read first the fight because it, it that excitement is what will lead to more people going on and reading about it because it's yeah. just it's a good story as well as being important. It's just worth reading about for I don't want to use the word entertainment, but for for that it's just exciting to read about yeah and I, I mean you're right and in the same way I, it, it's kind of got to be well done as well and I'd, yeah I'd, you know, I'd like to think that um you know i write reasonably well and and sort of do a good job so uh that that has to work too yeah well we'll bring things to an end i'll just stay with me for a minute i'll just remind people what we got coming up to and i'll come back and say goodbye in a second yeah. so well fantastic as some of you just said there the conversation started in one place went around lots of layers to it like an onion someone just said in the sidebar so that's that's very uh got nice to receive that feedback there tomorrow evening uh, Alexander Clifford is talking about um, uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, Hitler's generals, those, some of those figures in that pre-World War II era that were influential in how things evolved in the Third Reich. That'll be fantastic. And as we alluded to today, Ian Johnson's coming on a Friday to talk about his book, Faustian Bargain, about the Soviet-German pact, which will be a great way to end this week, talking about this if we think the relationship with Poland was complicated, as Roger has alluded to today, the relationship with Soviet-Germany was way more complicated but fundamental for us to understand to understand that period in the war so as usual folks the link to buying roger's book is in the description below you can find his website there as well i'm holding it up there first to fight that's just a, one of the books there's a whole series of them don't forget to follow what we're doing on social media consider becoming a patron consider becoming a member of the channel uh follow roger on twitter because there's lots of good history coming from him there but right now it remains for me to say thank you very much to roger for enjoy for, for spending your evening with us did you enjoy talking to our group absolutely can i just shamelessly this is the us edition i know you, you said I yeah, yeah sure yes followers and listeners and viewers and so on i'm trying to get it in the picture properly yeah it's in there uh, now yeah that's uh, so poland 1939 it's the same book as first to fight um but that's the us edition so um and that's coming out in paperback uh later on this i think october this year so at the moment it's only in hardback good i i in the that, us and canada i yeah. will add that to the description because i couldn't find it on america but i didn't realize it had a different title i will amend that immediately so thank you very much for your time roger i hope you will come thank back you. at some point in the future and go into some other detail about it because it's you know we all should be talking more about poland and and, and the eastern front generally so uh, i if you've enjoyed being here i've enjoyed having you on so it's been fantastic so so, folks, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow evening, same time, 7 p.m. UK, when we look at, I say, Hindenburg and Ludendorff and Alexander Clifford's works uh, at understanding and unraveling those characters. So thank you very much for your time. I will see you all again. Cheers, everybody. Have a good rest of uh, today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.